Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, being here for this uh, evening of conversation uh, with, I guess, I mean, there's so many things to call you, but I'll, I'll just list them down. You are a novelist, a historian, a diplomat. Um, you've won so many awards. Uh, you're, Wikipedia calls you a globetrotter as well. So uh, you've lived in one life many, many lifetimes. <laughs> I think a lot of people would even uh, dream of. So uh, when uh, the French Embassy approached me uh, in light of this conversation. Uh, I marveled at the, 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 how prolific you are and how worldly you are, and I thought that uh, you would have a lot to offer in terms of understanding the current state of the world as it is. And what I mean by that is particularly the contradiction between the advances and the promises we experience every day through expansion of technology. Right? We are more connected than ever. Um, we have access to knowledge like never before in uh, human history. Um, we are more exposed to different cultures than ever before. But on the other hand, the promise is also met with a sense of doom and worry and crisis. Right? So um, we are facing ecological disaster, mass extinction. We're facing um, unstable regimes, right? Or countries that we thought would be stable are becoming unstable. So there's a lot to make sense of when we think about what's happening in the world. And I figured that somebody of uh, your experience and your stature and your knowledge would, would um, help us with that. But I do want to begin on a very personal note, perhaps. Um, and maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about how the different dimensions of your worldview, you know, as somebody trained in neurology and psychiatry, an ambassador, a novelist, do those different things speak to one another or do you compartmentalize? Tell us a little bit about what goes on in your mind, I guess. So let's, let's start with that and then we'll branch off to the bigger world questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, dear Fouad. I'm very honored to be invited tonight in Malaysia. Uh, Unfortunately, I see there are many French people here. Instead of listen, listening a, a good French talk, you will have to listen to my broken English, but uh, I apologize and we'll try our best to be uh, understandable. Well, um, generally, when uh, people are talking about uh, my career, uh, my life, uh, they um, give the impression that I am a some crazy person who makes uh, so, so many different things. Um, the reality is that um, I have only, unfortunately, one single life and uh, 24 hours uh, in a day, uh, not more. Uh, so the, the, my story is very simple. I am um, a medical doctor, I'm a physician. And this is very important for me to um, to keep uh, a strong link with that. Uh, on my passport, I will write uh, my profession is a physician, always. Because I think that you can have different experiences in your life. You only, you only have uh, one uh, formation. formation. You, are, you, you are trained for one thing. And when you are 20, you learn something or you don't. And I learned um, medicine. And this has changed and, uh, my mind forever. I, whatever I, I do, whatever is my position in life, I look at um, the world as a doctor, which is completely specific. Because um, a doctor has, uh, uh, first of all, an interest for uh, human beings, not structures, not powers, not, uh, you know, great stakes like this, but our view is always uh, through a single person. And the person is the, really for us uh, the, 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 the matter really of uh, our uh, profession first. And second, uh, we look at uh, the human being to try to improve its condition. You know, uh, we, don't, we don't look at the human being to put him in jail or to control uh, uh, his documents or to see whether he... You know, we look at um, 
what we can improve in his life. And this is also something very specific. And also we look at people. Um, I think there is uh, something very specific also in this uh, training that we learn how to, it's, it's the first step, you know, of the medical examination is to look at the person. And it's not that frequent in the common life. Uh, it's an experience that uh, the, the men who have a moustache and cut the moustache they make, you know, they cut their moustache and around them some people will mention that they have cut the moustache three weeks after, you know, because nobody looks at the other. They're, we are trained to look at the people. And this is very important, this direct experience of things, you know, very concrete, you know. And after that, uh, once you have, uh, once you have uh, really, you are inside uh, the, the, you have in your skin really this, this skill of, uh, of being a, a physician, uh, you can do whatever you want. And for me, uh, uh, the, the way I practiced was very different because uh, uh, I was not that much interested by the technical aspects of, of medicine. I was very much in, interested in the, in the basic medicine because uh, I, have cho I have chosen this, this profession um, in relation to my grandfather because for familial reasons I was uh, brought up until I was 10 by my grandparents and my grandfather was a physician. Uh, he went through two world wars um, with direct exposure to, to, to the dramatic situations. In the First World War, he was uh, in the front uh, operating people, you know, uh, wounded and uh, soldiers uh, in the battlefield. And in the Second World War, he was uh, uh, a resistant. He was involved in a, in a, a network for um, resistance to the German uh, invasion. And so I was very much trying to continue this. Uh, for me, medicine, that, that was that. That was this kind of life. And it's not for me. Eh? It's very, I respect that because there are people who are interested in research or uh, technical, uh, very precise technical, you know, uh, activities. It was not my interest. And I wanted to keep um, this tradition of clinical um, presence and activity. And by chance, by chance, um, uh, my generation was um, a contemporary with the, the creation of Médecins Sans Frontières and these uh, humanitarian uh, very specific groups which appeared in, in France uh, in the 70s. I joined them. And then it brought me uh, far away uh, uh, and to, to experience many different things, many different uh, uh, conflicts, uh, crisis situation. And even, even for other reasons that we can talk about, uh, um, to have uh, some responsibilities in, in the diplomatic uh, uh, world. But never, never I would say that I am a diplomat. There is here, uh, there are real diplomats in this kind, in this uh, room. I'm not. I had diplomatic. Um, I had to assume a diplomatic charge for a while, but it's not my um, profession. And so, as I said, I am a doctor who writes books. That's all. That's very fascinating, uh, and I like it that you ground your entire life's work in, in a concern about the human condition and improving it. Um, and that regardless of how you've been defined, you still hold on to your identity as a doctor and there's a, a rich history of your grandfather and his influence and so forth. But was there a turning point when you realize you have a voice? Because okay? you hear about this a lot, doctors, obviously there's a, there's a lot of empathy, there's a lot of dedication, devotion to, to serving others, but having a voice being a public intellectual is a different demand, right? Because you, um, you're accountable not just to one person or to, to, to health, but to the truth, to justice, right? And that's, to me, it seems like a different calling, right? So at what point, was there a turning point you realized, well, being a doctor is great, but I also have a voice and I need to express it. And I think this voice 
can do as much good as my medical knowledge. Yes, your point is, is really very interesting because um, when I am involved in, uh, in action, I, I always and, and very rapidly miss uh, expression. I mean, action for me is uh, the base for, uh, for an expression. I mean, to transform this experience into, uh, uh, into a text, into something that you share with others. And I think this, this comes from very far. Uh, it's, it's, it's a deep um, feeling f for me for, for a long time. And maybe, probably, um, if my family was, uh, had been more uh, um, rich, it, if I had uh, not to, 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 to start uh, earning my life early, uh, I would have said, I will dedicate myself from the beginning to be a writer, but I could not. And I think life uh, granted me uh, something very good, you know, because it's, it is very good to first live and then write. I mean, when you do the other way around, I mean, you just, well, anyway, I would, well, stop. I won't comment. But um, you can try, but I think you have to experience life. And um, I could not experience life better than with the medical experience, which is a, a, a life and death experience. Uh, I was 23 when I was, um, I became um, an intern, I had the internship, you know, internship for residentship, I mean, you would say in English, I think, uh, in the uh, Parisian hospitals. I was 23. And I remember when the first time an ambulance came, I was uh, on duty, you know, so all the people had gone away. I was alone uh, in the hospital, big hospital of Paris, and the ambulance came and I had to face a problem and cope with that, you know. And I remember, because you always remember the first time in love, it's the same, I, I think. And uh, my first patient was a man with a, um, a gastric hemorrhage, you know, and I was 23, you know, and I was alone. And this is something that you will never uh, forget, of course. And it is too, for me, uh, it is too uh, strong as an experience to keep that for you, I mean, you have to share it with someone. Uh, so you can, you can tell that when you come home uh, and tell that to your wife or to your friends, yeah. anyway. But it's not enough, you know. You have to share when the experience is so strong and so, uh, you have to share it, really. Um, and so after this the involvement in humanitarian action, I started to try to write. But it's not easy for a, a doctor because uh, I didn't study literature, not at all. And even now, even now, when at a dinner, at a lunch, uh, I am sitting beside someone who will tell me, did you read this or did you read this? Generally, I didn't, you know, and I feel, yeah, so I say, no, uh, yes, maybe, uh, well, the reality, <laughs> is that my culture is a, a great, you know, there is full of holes, you know, a, because uh, when the others were, those who studied literature were studying or reading uh, La Recherche du Temps Perdu, I was studying the, the name of the arteries, you know, the blood vessels and all such kind of things. So once I wanted to try to write, the first thing was to, to go to, to the easiest way to do it, and I started uh, writing uh, essays, political essays. Uh, my first book were there, were, were such. It was just to try directly to share the, the, directly the experience that I had in these different fields. Um, but if I can say one word, uh, you know, th those first essays, uh, okay, they, they were trying to express what I was feeling, but uh, at that time uh, I was teaching in a political science school in Paris, because 
And my students who wanted to, you know, please to the professor, so they were making speeches on my books, those essays. And they were making sm small, uh, they were summar summarizing what I wanted to say. And I was desperate. And I said, that is, that is that. You know, I, I, you know they, they were just taking, picking up the ideas. But for me, the most important thing was not the ideas. It was the feelings, it was the colors, it was the, the portraits, it was the landscapes, it was the descriptions, you know, it was the emotions. And all this, you cannot put it in a, in a political essay. There is only one way to do that. Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, are you still there? Uh, there is only one way to express yourself uh, uh, in these very personal things. It's the novel. It's the novel, and so I started. Um, I started the no to to write novels. But writing novels for someone who really deeply feels that he is uh, he doesn't have, you know, the, the the culture for that. It's a very high step, you know. And um, fortunately, I was helped by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, because I was sent at that time. Uh, 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 as an uh, attaché uh, culturel and cooperation um, in Brazil. In a little uh, um, consulate in Brazil that has disappeared since. Uh, in, they sent me there. And so I must say, all the diplomats work hard, but, but not me uh, at that time, because I was in a very small. Uh, you know, I have no budget, nothing, uh, I had nothing to do. And so I took this opportunity to start writing novels. So my first novel was really uh, uh, subscribed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, in a way. <laughs> uh, my predecessor in that, uh, as attaché culturel in Recife, he was um, a philosopher. Uh, a guy who was really very gifted, but he was smoking a lot and many things, you know, different things. And he was doing nothing, uh, nothing at all. He had destroyed completely the, the, the office. And uh, the Quai d'Orsay, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, sent him to Kathmandu, you know, in <laughs> Nepal. It's, it's a good administration, I should say. <laughs> And uh, so when I arrived, I had nothing to do. And my first novel, I wrote it by this uh, occasion. And that was a great, great um, experience for me because I wrote it not because I have a voice, as you said, because this I realized much uh, a long time after, you know. In the beginning, I just wrote for myself just to to share this experience, but with, I don't, I, I didn't know with whom, you know. Uh, first of all, I wanted to, to I had a, a kind of burden on my soul, you know, with all with, and I wanted to, you know, become uh, more uh, free and uh, uh, by putting out these, these words. And I, I had a, a secretary at that time was typing, because I still now, they, I write by hand. And uh, the secretary, she was typing my essays before. And once she was typing my essays, she was, you know, uh, fe falling asleep, you know, deeply. And once I gave her my first novel, she woke up. And she was excited, and she was giving her opinion. She was saying, ah, oh, this one, he is dead. Uh, it's uh, too early, and such kind of things. And I realized that maybe that could be, as you said, a voice. This experience to write for yourself can reach an aim that you didn't have. In the beginning, it's you can communicate your emotions. You can, 
you can share that with someone. You can have an audience. You can have people who read your books. And this, I realized, uh, you know, by doing it, not, it was not my purpose, or it, it was not because I was thinking that I had things to say to the world. Not at all. It was just a personal, intimate process, but which reached uh, a, a public. And at that time, I was, um, after I came back from Brazil and all, uh, I started again working in a hospital in Paris, L'Hôpital Saint Antoine. And I was visiting the patients in the morning with all the, you know, the nurses, the students, uh, the, the residents, and all. And I was the chief. And when you are the chief, you uh, go. You are the last one who goes out of the room. You know, it's like the captain of a ship, except in Italy. And then uh, you, when I was going out of the room, the people were saying to me, "Doctor." Uh, we have something to tell you. So all the nurse, everybody was going. You know? And then they were opening the cupboard and giving me my novel to sign. And that is, it was an emotion that you can imagine. And it's at that moment that I realized that maybe, maybe that could be also a way of, of being in the world, you know, by writing. Uh, so, why did you choose to become an ambassador then? Because um, it seems that representing the state, you know, uh, runs contrary to what you said earlier about, you know, you, you speak not really committed to any concerns about structure, it's fundamentally about the human person. You talked about the importance of express, expression, right? Freely expressing yourself. And, those two things aren't necessarily embodied in the task of an ambassador. You, might, you have to be a diplomat, you have to be strategic. You can't just speak whenever and whatever. So that's an interesting turn in your path. So tell me a little bit about the decision making behind that. I didn't make the decision really. Uh, I, was, I received this, uh, this proposal of the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs at that time. Uh, he called me and s said to me, um, uh, we want to open the, the recruitment of the ambassador and to have uh, people coming from the civil society. And specifically, uh, to work in Africa, we would like people who are not involved in those you know, traditional Franco-African networks and so on and so forth. And he said, and we propose to you uh, to be uh, ambassador in, uh, in Senegal. So I said, can I think about it? And he said, yes. And I said, when should I give an answer? He said, with, he said, within 10 minutes, you know? <laughs> so since I am um, stupid, probably, and, uh, and I like risk, you know, I said, yes. And I don't regret that. I think uh, that was a great experience. It's a very difficult uh, profession, very difficult. It's um, something, well, to be the chief of a uh, uh, um, diplomatic delegation is different as to be in the system. It's, it's, there are some countries, like for instance, United States, uh, they use people coming from civil society to put them uh, as head of delegation. So it, it's just a different system. But you have to work, to work hard because uh, to learn many things, uh, especially in the relation between France and Africa, uh, France and Senegal, which is particularly complex. Uh, you have. It's, it's very touchy, it's very touchy. It's, I think one of the most difficult, maybe, uh, position. There are different countries like that, Morocco, Senegal, uh, which are so linked to France, uh, in which the, the, the head of the state has so direct contact with the head of the state in France that the position of the ambassador is, is really complex. But it's complex every, everywhere, any, anyway. Um, but just to say a word, I was not considering that it was a different um, life for me. It was a different experience. 
but not for the, the, the life. And uh, I never thought that it, that it, will, it will last more, more than the three years um, in which I, I, I was there. And during that, that time, I picked up so many uh, of these impressions that I used by a novelist to write. You know, there are so many people you meet. You know, there are so many situations you experience. There are so many places in which you travel that really it feeds your imagination. Of course, it you don't have time to 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 write the book to use them maybe immediately, but it's in the mind and then. Uh, you can use it. Uh, and I was certain that having this new experience uh, would be very useful as a, as a novelist. Uh, so it's not contradictory with what I, I said in the beginning. Interesting. So um, after Brazil, uh, after Senegal, where, like you said, you were thrown in the middle of a very complex uh, situation, a complex history. Now you're in Malaysia. I mean, you, you've, I mean that's just a small sample of the places you've been to. Uh, tell us a little bit about your current impressions of France, or maybe even Europe more broadly, as it's struggling with the questions of identity, right? Because you demonstrate a certain openness to difference, right? Like you said, you like risk, uh, and risk is important for growth, for learning, but it's a different matter for the state. States generally don't like risks, right? Countries, nations generally don't like risks, right? Um, but uh, it seems right now, um, in France, or maybe in Germany, in, or Europe more broadly, the question of what it means to be French, what it means to be European, is being contested. So, perhaps as a segue to the more global aspect of our discussion, maybe you can start with your impressions of the situation there. Yes, uh, it's a difficult question. It's a difficult question. I'm not sure I have um, a better position to answer than many others who experience the same uh, situation here. Um, just I wanted to say one thing um, about, about the specificity of, of French um, uh, building of the state. Uh, we have a very ancient nation state, which is completely different of our neighbors, you know. History of Germany, history of Spain, history of uh, Italy, uh, history of recent, you know, building of, of new states, you know. Uh, when Bismarck has declared the Second uh, Reich, uh, it was in Versailles, uh, it's, it's very late, 1817. Uh, Italy, the, the building of the state in Italy is 1861. Yeah? Uh, those countries are you know, we are, we are clustered, like there was split in different uh, small uh, province. France has built its nation very early, um, little by little, and I should say naturally, but also by a decision. Um, in the 17th century, um, uh, Louis XIII and Richelieu, have decided, really, to build the, the base and the instruments of a nation state, which is very specific. And one of these instruments is a, a, an institution to which I, I take part. I'm very proud of it. It's uh, the Académie Française. It has been created in uh, 1634, you know, 34. It's very, very old institution. It's the oldest institution of the nation, not only the republic, but the nation. And since that time, we have uh, continuously, except for a, a few years during the revolution, but uh, we have continuously built uh, or participate to the building of a nation through uh, the language. It's very interesting to see that one of the process for Richelieu to build the nation was to give it, to, to, to give uh, um, to, to France a language, a common language, and to give also the instrument, to give the opportunity for this language to express all the, what should be, what should be necessary in art and in science, 
And this is our uh, duty. It is to try to, 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 to make an evolution of the language too, which is very difficult in this, in this moment, uh, to adapt this language, uh, to, 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 to give it the, the possibility of expressing every, uh, every ideas and every kind of art. And that was not obvious at that time because Latin was very much used because Italian, Spanish were used and the French court and all. So we have built uh, that. So uh, I think identity problem uh, in France should be seen through this um, very strong uh, centralization, very ancient building of the state, you know. Uh, it's, it's more difficult maybe for us to accept a certain kind of diversity because we have this conception of a very centralized um, power and uh, the monarchy and the uh, republic. The, re the, re the French Revolution did not contest that at all. Huh? So, uh, we have always stressed the importance to have a central uh, state. So uh, our instrument is very powerful, but it is not very um, compliant, I mean, to be adapted to a situation of globalization in which uh, the populations are coming from all over the, the world and have to be assimilated or at least um, to reach a certain form of coexistence, yeah, uh, because uh, uh, our conception is, 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 is like that, you know. For instance, an example, we forbid completely the ethnical statistics in our country. It's forbidden to register somewhere that you are uh, Chinese, you are white, you are black, you are Jew, you are uh, Muslim. It's forbidden. Uh, for the, the, the Americans, for instance, this is completely uh, surprising because for them it's the contrary. They would consider it's, a, it's, a, it's the first step of comprehension and acknowledgement of these communities to first count who is uh, or declared to be, because it's declarative, to say, I am black, I am uh, white, I am uh, uh, from Asia, etc. And so. and for them, it's, it's a matter of, of freedom. For us, it's impossible the French state acknowledge only citizens without any consideration of their origin. This is the theory. This is the theory. But uh, this is the way we think. And of course, it's much more difficult to, to, to accept you know, the existence of a diversity inside this framework, which is very monolithic. That's very interesting. So. France having an, a longer history of state building makes it less flexible than other states, right? So, um, I think. And the Malaysian case, I mean, is probably the good counter example to that because we're still a young state, you know, and um, even then, I mean, a good, ex a good uh, example as well alongside the American is ours, right? Where we have to list ourselves as Malay, Chinese, and Indian, and others, so on and so forth, you know, and. Um, so we're struggling as well to, because the question, of what, the question of what is the state is really a question of who belongs to the state, right? Um, what is the state's identity? Um, now, is the, quest, the, the, prop, the struggle with you know, refugees or, or Muslims in, in France, is it, to what extent is it a continuation of a longer question since decolonization? Because the French state has not always looked like it is today. The shape was different, you know, not too long ago, right? Uh, especially during the Algerian Civil War, um, rather the Algerian War of Independence. Uh, and of course, Haiti was another example as well. So uh, can you help contextualize this question? Are the issues that we're facing today in France uh, a new thing? Or is it linked to the unsettled issues from decolonization? No, you're very right. It's, um, there are contradictions in this uh, building of the nation state because, for instance, uh, you must remember that colonization was justified 
by uh, the socialists in the beginning. In the, uh, to, the, the idea was to bring the enlightenment of the civilization to these uh, wild uh, uh, tribes in Africa or, or anywhere else. And this created a, a kind of schizophrenic situation because um, what was the perspective of that? The, the perspective of that was if nothing had happened, if those countries were not decolonized, if Algeria was still French, you would have uh, 40 millions of Algerian uh, uh, and uh, Moroccan and um, Tunisian who would be French. Uh, nobody wants that. I mean, nobody. That was not the idea. That was not. And today there are contradictions, for instance. The, those who today are the most reluctant to uh, immigration, are most opposed to massive immigration, are the same who were uh, in favor of um, the presence of Algeria in France. They were against... Uh, Le Pen was against the decolonization and is also against immigration, which is a very strange, you know, this is really the root of, of the contradiction uh, uh, that we are exper expecting, uh, um, experimenting, uh, experiencing uh, today. It's that this, this uh, uh, simple, I would say, conception of nation state, bon, was already difficult with the province. Uh, the, the, People from Brittany would explain to you how uh, they were forced to abandon their, their native uh, language. In, and it was forbidden to speak Breton in the schools and all. But more or less, inside the, the hexagon, it was quite possible, I mean, to solve it with this principle. Uh, when you reach the, the empire, the, the, the dimension of empire, this becomes very difficult. And today, most of the problems uh, that we face for, for this coexistence of different uh, people in the same state come from these people um, coming from our former colonies. I mean, because the, the, this contradiction has not been solved, not at all. I think this is a good... We, I'm sorry, oh. Fred, but we have decided that that would be a conversation and that you will explain to me What's the Malaysian situation? <laughs> well, I guess the, the immediate difference is that we were colonized by the British. And the British had a, I mean, they had a lot of issues, but there, were, <laughs> there was at least a difference in administrative attitude. There's still a lot of racism, there's still the, the civilizing uh, superiority. They, they looked down the colonies, but at least in terms of the bureaucracy, they ran, at least in terms of how um, their presence would be administered. Uh, there was often a tendency to indirect, indirectly rule. So in the Malaysian context, uh, this was done through the Malay rulers, who at that point had uh, default authority because they were controlling uh, some territories and um, trade. So rather than governing Malays directly, they would say that they would advise the kings um, and only impose or comment on matters relating to tradition. Um, so, uh, oh sorry, only uh, impose or comment matters related to commerce, right? So tradition would be uh, put aside. So there was a lot of uh, racism, but structurally it tried to maintain some sort of a distance from directly encountering uh, the natives, so to speak. And even in, in the Malaysian context, when there were uh, colonial officers who did um, speak to the locals and everything, a lot of it was for archaeological reasons. So they would document, a lot of them were just outright racist documentations, but you could tell they saw the locals more of a specimen to observe from a distance rather than to sort of take over and, and, and loot and, and all that. Um, largely, too, there were... Um, I guess budgetary constraints is more efficient to directly, uh, indirectly rule because it would just be uh, less costly. So there was also the problem of India being very nearby. So a lot of resources, a lot of the attention uh, fell on India as opposed to a more relatively 
small country. But I think uh, what, what I find interesting too um, about the scenario you depicted is that maybe the fact that Malaysia is a younger state means that there's a lot more room to maneuver around it. So I don't deny that in the Malaysian case, there is definitely a police state. There's greater expansion of Islamic laws. Um, there are threats to civil liberties. But in a lot of ways, the state is just still trying to figure itself out. I mean, we just had our first proper regime change. You know, I mean, it took long enough, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, but even then, it's because of a familiar face, right? So Mahade, <laughs> the new government is run by somebody we've already known. So uh, in that sense, you can say that the old influence is still there. So we're still trying to figure out what this state is about, because there's still more new laws being written too, you know, about who counts as Muslim, you know, what sorts of doctrines should be imposed. Um, and I don't mean to diminish the seriousness of the situation, but I think there's something to France being such an established state that there's far less room to, 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 to adapt and adjust in the, in the way that maybe in Malaysia, there's always like informal channels, right? So just think of the informal market here, right? How many things can be bought, like how many bootleg things can be bought, how many counterfeit things can be bought, how much of the market isn't just regulated because it's so easy to just like fake things and then make money off it, you know? And it's almost, you can't do that in Europe, right? Unless, maybe if you know the right channels, but it's so mainstream now that, you know, I mean, that's a very everyday example of how the state sort of like gets lazy or gets complacent and doesn't know really how to handle the fact that there are organic ways to organize society that doesn't really require the state, you know. Um, it could be the other reason too that Europe was so destroyed in the Second World War in the way that Southeast Asia wasn't, right? We didn't, ha we didn't have a Dresden. There's nothing like that. We didn't have a Battle of Berlin. So, um, which meant that the reconstruction of the state was even more urgent, right? You had to resuscitate something that was uh, different than the previous regime. So the contest there seems more intense in the way that here, I mean, the, the Japanese came here by bicycles, right? I mean, that's just something. And the reason why they could do that is because they were going to liberate us from Europe, right? But again, there was no Dresden, right? There was no battle for Berlin, right? The battle for Singapore, but far less, far less, of, far less drama and, and, and atrocities than say what happened in Berlin. Obviously, Berlin, Dresden, and Germany, but just as a, in terms of just France's position in the idea of Europe, right? Um, there are interesting comparisons that can be made. Um, which, you know, makes me wonder too, for the longest time, as, at least during the revolution, the Republican experiment was seen as this global achievement that for once, the people can take power for themselves and overthrow a monarch that had been ruled by divine ordinance for so long. And human history had not seen that sort of boldness at that level. And so much so that you know, Thomas Paine, a writer from uh, England, participated and uh, even I think ran for, for, for office I think in France and then of course Haiti liberated itself because they said, well, if they're overthrowing uh, uh, injustice in France, why don't, we, why don't we free ourselves, right? So what's happened to that? perception. Do, is there a sense in France that the French model is still something the world should emulate or has that sort of, <laughs> has that sort of become more cynical? Because um, when I read philosophy too, right, there, there's a reason why um, so much of the curriculum is French political philosophy, right? So whether it's uh, Voltaire, uh, Rousseau, you know, Rousseau Swiss, but you know, later on, Sartre, Foucault, and all that, right? The fact that there's something about protest, there's value in protest, there's value in resistance, right? There's value in thinking of a new order. And this is as much a part of French history, if you think about the revolutionary tradition. So give us an update of where you think that is today. Well, I, I think that we, we are uh, always thinking uh, in a universal way. Uh, let's see, for instance, uh, the law. 
the, uh, when, when you refer to the English law, the case law, you don't have a, a, a fixed frame, but every case creates, I mean, the law. I mean, it's a, it's a very practical way of experimenting, experiencing the, what's going on and looking uh, certain rules, very simple, and how you can uh, use them for that case. Uh, in France, never. You will uh, write the law uh, expecting and, and planning all what can happen, you know. Uh, <clears throat> even, for instance, in the, the, the mayor of Bordeaux, Alain Juppé, uh, told me once, when, when, he was, uh, uh, when he was elected the first time, he decided to build um, a tramway, you know, a tramway in Bordeaux. And this tramway in the center of Bordeaux has no wire you know, it's, uh, it's, it's on the ground. And they, the technical administration of the state, to accept this system, had to plan, uh, you know, to expect cases, the most improbable cases. For instance, uh, if someone was touching uh, with a can, a can, a can you know, the wire, the, he could have uh, receive electricity, but to receive to touch the the wire was again, not the wire, the the the, the rail was again. You had to be very small, so only a dwarf with a cane <laughs> could be concerned, you know. And, but that was thought by the administration. If a, a dwarf with a cane will come, what will you do? So never, you know. It's, 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 it's a way of thinking, everything which can happen, we have this way of thinking. I mean, planning um, something universal, some, something which uh, every, every event should be already uh, uh, expected and, and previewed. Uh, for philosophy, I think it's something in the, in the same way. We like philosophies that could be... Um, applicable to the human being it, in general, you know. For instance, the human rights of the, uh, the second of the, of the revolution, the declaration of human rights, are universal or should be universal. I mean, uh, um, we didn't agree, for instance, with the conception of the United Nations and the declaration of human rights of the... Um, have separated human rights uh, in the political and civil way, which are universal, and the social rights, you know, the right to, uh, to, 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 to be uh, uh, fed, the right to have a roof, the right to, be, uh, uh, to receive uh, uh, health. Uh, no, this is different. I mean, you can have a different conception, uh, but the civil right, we, we, we don't understand that something can be uh, considered different for a, for a Chinese or for a French or for an Italian or for a, a, an African. It's the same. It should be the same. This universal way of thinking is still, I think, uh, our uh, um, common uh, way of thinking. But the problem is that this is very contradictory with the way we have uh, coped with colonization. Because uh, in colonization, we have explained to these people who were colonized that uh, we were bringing them those, uh, those common uh, rights, considering them as citizens. And suddenly, after the decolonization, we have closed the border and they became different. For instance, in Africa, you know, I spent a lot of time there, you know, and, and I was in position of accepting or not, even if it's not the ambassador, it's the consul, but you have to have an opinion on this, the problem of visas. The problem of visa is something very difficult to explain to people who have been, at first, uh, I'm speaking of Senegalese, considered as French, as part of a community that we we are considering as citizens, and suddenly we say to come to France, you need a visa. And 
of course it's something which is understandable and and it's it's perfectly legitimate from a state to say you know, there would be visa for such a but it's very difficult to conciliate that with um, the the first you know statement which was a statement of uh, equality and liberation and this is this is why our principles you know which still are uh, I think a good principle. I'm a universalist. I really f feel that uh, um, the, the the rights are the same. I mean, I, I, I never, you know, I've experienced many conflicts. I know I never uh, met a victim who would say, I, I'm pleased to be tortured, you know. No, nobody would tell you that, you know. It's a common right. And when, when someone, when... Uh, uh, um, in the government or someone explains to you that, you know, in our culture, you know, the, the death penalty is normal, it's, it's good, uh, and people accept it, and, uh, you know, and... We, no, I mean, why not? But if there are rules of this kind, they, could be, they should be universal. There, there's no reason to say there are rights for Africans and others for... for but the problem is that ourselves, we're in contradiction with this principle in our policy. And, the, and this creates the, 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 the ongoing uh, uh, malaise, the ongoing difficulty of, uh, of, uh, of the present situation. Uh, we've talked about empire quite a lot because we cannot understand the, the current struggles in France about multiculturalism, co uh, coexistence without looking at the history of France's civilizing mission throughout the world, right? So you have... Um, I mean, it went even near all the way here, right, then in Indochina. Um, the situation, at least here for, for Malaysia, is quite interesting because if you look at, we have our history of colonialism with the British, before that with the uh, Dutch and Portuguese and the Japanese. And in the 90s, globalization was largely talked about as Americanization, right? So this even was uh, a build up in the 1980s when Mahathir said, let's turn to Japan as a developmental model, let's not turn to America, you know, and, um, and he took very anti-American positions in, in diplomacy as well um, as a result. But now the situation has changed because China has imposed its presence and dominance in the region. There's a military buildup in the South China Sea. There are um, uh, military drills that is clashing with Filipino military, Vietnamese military and stuff like that. So, the notion of power is changing as well, where previously, when you think about global dominance, it was largely white people. Now, uh, it's yellow people, I guess. Oh, it's now it's the Chinese, I guess, but the, it's still the same structure, but a different part of the world, right? Um, tell us a little bit then about maybe how the anxieties are felt in France, because France's long history of empire now is being overshadowed. They don't know. There seems to be a lot of issues with French identity. But at the same time now, the hege hegemony is in China. They have a lot of uh, political and, and, and trading leverage. And of course, they're also encroaching in Africa now, where um, Europe used to be. I know this is a big question. <laughs> but you, know, you are a global person yourself, so this is where I think your perspective is very valuable. But how would you situate the loss of the history of colonialism that France once had and the rise of a rival empire. Is, is that a part of the picture too? Yeah. We, we, you know, we, we had different experience of this um, empire you're speaking about. For instance, after the revolution, the French Revolution, there was the Napoleonian experience, which was an empire. And this empire, in the beginning, was um, presented by Napoleon himself as the extension of the principle of the revolution to the whole uh, Europe, which meant the, to the whole world at that time, because they... And um, there was a, a moment in which the contradiction also has raised. Uh, it's the question of slavery, you know, because uh, Napoleon has... Uh, was defending and was bringing the, the, the ideas of the French Revolution everywhere. But at a certain moment, uh, he decided to reauthorize slavery in uh, Haiti, if I, in the, in the Antilles. 
And this is the moment in which the father of Alexandre Dumas, uh, who was black, who was the, the son of a, of a, a slave, uh, a slave woman married to a, uh, <clears throat> to a, to a, um, a white French uh, colonizer, um, the General Dumas, who was the father of Dumas, decided to, uh, you know, he didn't accept that. It's the moment in which the revolution turned into the empire. Uh, and, and there is always, in uh, the question of empire, this, this very fragile uh, border between liberation and oppression, you know? Uh, the, the empire of Napoleon was, at first, a huge uh, project of liberation of the people in Europe. And in a certain extent, it was it. It was. It has given the idea of men, to many people in Central Europe, I mean, uh, nationalities in Central Europe, that they, they should have their own uh, freedom as a people and also as a, as a person. Uh, but at the same time, in very, you know, uh, there was a, a small threshold, and he went through the threshold, and, and that became an empire and that became something uh, different. So for, for, for the situation today, well, and after we had another, another experience, which was the colonial empire, which is also the same uh, very thin you know, limit. Uh, this colonial empire was at first uh, a project of liberation of these people and uh, bringing civilization to them. And then, little by little, it became a, a, a project and a, a reality of oppression. So it's, it's always difficult. And uh, today, it's something in, in the same, same way we can observe that the, the evolution of these empires of today, which, uh, which are more difficult to judge, but look at the United States. I mean, United States, we, which were for a long time, especially in Europe, considered as uh, bringing uh, liberation, liber bringing freedom, bringing uh, the truth during the, the Cold War, uh, the truth was the, you know, on the West, and the lie was on the, on the Soviet, you know. And, and little by little, you know, the, the, the war, the first Gulf uh, War, you know, which was based on a lie, it was very difficult to accept that um, those people who bring liberation I mean, can lie and he can, can manage to, 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 to organize uh, the aggression of a country for a lie, which is very difficult. And today the evolution of the United States as well, you know, is, um, is very worrying because uh, the, the limit is, is thin uh, between, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say dictatorship, it would be uh, crazy, but you know, uh, how long this uh, empire would keep their um, capacity of being uh, uh, of being uh, instruments of freedom, and uh, yeah, we are talking about Africa and and China. Uh, China has a, a very strange way, you know, to present its presence in Africa. I mean, they, they said to, to Africans that we you, we bring you. Um, um, a, um, a support without any condition, you know. But it's, it's not true. I mean, it's not true. It's a lie. Uh, they are preparing something which I consider, and many Africans consider it now also, as a very dangerous process of creating a, a domination on these uh, very fragile states, you know. And so that's why, you know, to have uh, an evaluation of what this empire would be in the future is, is, is always uh, dangerous. And I think f for a country like Malaysia, which I don't know and I will not uh, give an opinion about that, but uh, I think you are among uh, different zones of influence and it should be very difficult to find out to, to whom, uh, whom you can trust, you know, because um, I like it. Um, <laughs> I like it. They describe the thinness 
like a thin, fragile threshold between liberation and oppression. Because I think progress is really like that. Like every step forward, every gain made is not absolute. It's not really substantial. It has to be defended, right? Um, and some people panic and they will use as much force to defend it. And some people will use more rational appro approaches um, as well. Um, before we close the session, unfortunately, you know, we have to move to, um, you have to close this discussion and get everybody, uh, everybody's voices in, but can you make... A, a drink also. <laughs> good idea. Can you make a prognosis of sorts? Are things going to get better or worse? I mean, what's your sense of things? <laughs> in about two minutes. <laughs> I mean, your gut feeling, yeah. That, I have no idea, but what I can say, referring I mean, to our first topic, which was uh, why I've chosen medicine, I think when you, um, when you are a physician, you are experienced to, to face desperate situations all the time, but not to be desperate yourself. Otherwise, uh, if you cry when you see your patient, I mean, you know, it's, it's impossible. You don't help him. Don't help him. And, you, um, you know, sometimes, uh, even when he's responsible of his own, own uh, problems, when you see someone who is an alcoholic or who smokes two packets uh, of cigarettes a day, and, you know, he has a lung, uh, cancer of the lung, of course he's, he's responsible. But you cannot blame him and say, okay, uh, you have smoked two packets of cigarettes, it's your... It's your fault now. Go, go uh, and, and manage with your cancer. No, it's not that way. So uh, I think that you, you have to keep this in mind. And the humanitarian situation, uh, action also taught me that. It's that uh, sometimes people tell you, um, uh, well, in Africa, there are always conflicts. There are conflicts everywhere. It's a continent with wars uh, all the time. No, there are continent. There are wars in, in Africa, but not at the same place. Things uh, are improving in some places. Things are changing. I mean, Ivory Coast, uh, 10 years ago, was in a civil war, terrible civil war. Today, not, you know. But there would be uh, maybe uh, uh, a conflict somewhere else, you know, in Somalia or somewhere else. So, uh, I think you have not to make a kind of global, like this, recommendation, which is nonsense. But just to keep in mind that uh, every human uh, issue, I mean, is something that uh, uh, you should accept first. You should accept things uh, as they are. I mean, not, not to try to, to transform things, you know, say, no, they, there is no uh, global heating. I mean, it's stupid. You know, I live in the Alps and the, the glaciers are melting. And, and my, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it, it's nonsense. It has no way to, to, to think uh, this way. But um, try to keep energy, try to keep, um, I would not say optimism, it's, it's stupid, but a kind of, uh, yes, of energy to face problems and not to, to uh, I mean, become passive in front of, of what's going on. Right. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm like that. Great. Uh, well put, too. Uh, face the reality and try to maintain our resolve against the odds. Um, thank you for that. Uh, now we shall open the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, if you have anything, please raise your hand. We have somebody to pass you the mic. Yes, there's a gentleman right there. In French, maybe? En français, yes, <laughs> can. Uh, en français ou en anglais, alors no, uh, no, I think Maybe it's better in English, yeah. It's better because... Uh, yeah. Yeah. That, uh, One yeah. of the answers to the globalization that we see in Europe and in France is nationalism. In the recent speech of Emmanuel Macron, he makes that uh, the nationalism is the exact opposite of patriotism. What's, what's your view on that, on the expansion of the nationalism in France and in Europe, and the fact that we shall or shall not consider this as the exact opposite of patriotism. I just came back from a, a journey in, in Central Europe for um, writing two, two articles for uh, much. Um, and 
it was very interesting. I went to different, you know, spots, uh, Austria, Slovakia, Hungary, you know. Um, and it's very interesting to, to, to uh, look at what's going on in this, because it, uh, the, 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 the comment of Macron was regarding specifically uh, this region of the world, Hungary, you know. And it's very interesting to see that, um, well, I, I don't know for definition what is patriotism, what is nationalism. I think, you know, well, we could be there tomorrow morning for breakfast if we can discuss. But it's, it's too complicated for me. But uh, which I consider very dangerous is to make a, 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 a close choice between progressism and nationalism. Like if, if it, there would be in Europe, you know, two uh, very um, two groups, enemies, and uh, impossible to 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 to, to reunify. Uh, it's not like that. It's much more complicated than that. Than that. The, those uh, nationalist or so-called uh, powers in Central Europe uh, are, of course. For some of them, you know, like in Hungary, uh, it's it's very strong regime uh, with limitation of uh, freedom of speech and the institution are in in danger in a way. But this nationalism is not the th the, the the beginning of the th the false uh, Reich, you know, not at all. Because each of them is enemy of its neighbors. So I mean, nationalism is a kind of, of uh, you know, this different nucleus of, of uh, uh, enemy. When you go to Slovakia and you say, do you accept the Visegrad group? And they say, no, 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 no not at all. No, we, we had the Hungarian at home for uh, centuries. And no, 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 no. So they, they will say we are in sympathy with them. But no, no, not at all. They, they will keep their, their um, the respect of their own uh, nationalism. Uh, so each of them, you know, have small, small groups. No alternative to Europe. Nobody is creating a real alternative to Europe. Because the Visegrad group, for instance, uh, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, and, and Czechoslovakia, and, che and Czechia, uh, are not unified at all. At all. Uh, they just use that to, to threaten a little the Europe. But they are pro-European. All of them, they are pro-European. They want more power in, inside Europe. They want more uh, advantage inside Europe. But they live out of European uh, funds, you know. They, even the mafia there is specialized to, to, to you know, to, 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 to the détournement des, des fonds européens, même la mafia. Uh, they are European, and in the Brexit negotiation, I was discussing that with uh, Michel Barnier recently, he said, but for the Brexit, all these countries support our position in the Brexit negotiation, all, these, all of them, you know? So they are nationalists, okay? There is one issue on which they are, uh, have a common position, it's the position toward migra migration, yes? But for the rest, uh, they are European. They are European. Of course, they, you know, they try to make an opposition in, inside Europe, but they are inside Europe, you know. And when you describe them as a as a group, which, which is uh, uh, almost enemy, you know, uh, you you really make a great risk uh, to create something which could be uh, more serious than it is. Also much more serious than it is, because these countries for the moment are not anti-European, not at all. When you talk to Slovakia or Czech, uh, um, do you want to, to, to stay away from Europe? There was the, most of the, their industry, it's, uh, it's uh, um, um, car uh, um, assemblage, the, the voiture, etc. But they don't want, they don't want. So that's why, well, maybe it's not the topic, I'm sorry, it's not so interesting at all, but uh, you, you asked me the question, I tell you my, my feeling when, when I visited these, these countries, and I, I was really surprised, really surprised. And what we call, you know, we put stamps like this on, the, on those regimes, uh, considering that it's easy. But for instance, in Austria, the Minister of Foreign Affairs was my student, you know, 
long time ago. It was during the, uh, just after the, the, the First World War. Uh, it, it, she, she was my student in, uh, the, in Sciences Po, where I was, I, I, had, um, I was teaching there. And she was my student. And at that time, I met her, and she was uh, involved in Amnesty International, in the NGOs, and so on and so forth. And today she's uh, presented from abroad as the extreme right activist. She's not. I went to see her, she's not. It's, it's completely different. It's completely different. I mean, it's not the topic and I don't have time to explain, but I went to see her there and understand that it's, it's a very local uh, situation. Um, and all this propaganda which consider that they are all nationalists in a block like this, for me is very dangerous, very dangerous. We must keep uh, the specificity of these different situations and not uh, globalize, which is not. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Send it. Okay. And is the, I would like to ask about uh, past week, there's been a uh, German uh, Chancellor, Angela Merkel, has sidelined with President Emmanuel Macron about the calls for creating a European army to replace a NATO presence in European Union. So, in your opinion, is Europe need a unified uh, European army to replace NATO since we have saw the US hegemony in this world have been replaced and overshadowed by the Chinese hegemony? I'm not sure I've uh, listened very well, but are they, you're uh, asking me about the European army uh, versus NATO? Is, is yes, mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. Well, NATO is a very sensible um, topic because uh, it divides deeply um, this region of the, of the world, that's true. Um, for instance, Austria is neutral um, due to the treaty uh, after the, in, in 55 when they, they, they recovered its sovereignty. Uh, it's a neutral country. And it creates a very big difference with its neighbors, which, which are members of, uh, of NATO. Um, I think there are two things, you know. There is the opportunity of creating a, a, a European defense. Certainly yes, certainly yes. The possibility to do it, certainly not for the moment. Certainly not. I mean, I don't see any alternative. You know, we are in a very difficult moment uh, with the Brexit and all these things, you know. Uh, how can we process, uh, proceed, I mean, uh, in, a, in such a difficult way. I don't know, but I'm not the authorized person to talk about that, but I really am very doubtful about the possibility of doing that. So I think it's a, uh, it's a kind of political announce which is um, used in a certain uh, uh, context, but uh, it's not realistic for the moment, I think, I think. So NATO is for the moment uh, the only only Force. real uh, defense system that we, which covers uh, Europe. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much for sharing your insights and experience this evening. Um, I actually have a quite maybe comprehensive and complicated question, and I hope I worded it right. So, uh, Mr. Rahmat, if you think that my question is a bit inappropriate, please do stop me midway. Um, so, I'm asking as a sort of new Malaysian, um, looking forward to try and build this nation together with the new generation. Um, and one point you mentioned earlier this evening was very interesting regarding um, how France was built based on a single language, uh, which facilitates really good um, expression of arts and science. Um, I have an observation regarding Malaysia in regards to um, we have a lot of diversity in terms of language and culture. And a um, simple observation that you can see is when people start going to um, primary school, there's different uh, streams of school. So you can go to vernacular schools or, you know, different language mediums. Um, 
And even up to adulthood, you can see these communities being separated based on the languages and the cultures. Um, one notable observation is you can see different people hearing different radio channels and you get different contents. Um, sometimes what I feel is that tends to isolate communities. Um, do you see that this is a problem um, with regards to having multiple uh, language mediums and uh, different cultures? Is this something that we Malaysians should think about objectively? I'm not saying that there should be any preference to any um, language or any um, culture, um, but is this something that is important for our progress into you know, a more modern and um, developed country? Yep, thanks. But it, it's, it's very interesting and very difficult to answer because the, the, the role of language uh, in the as a, as a cement for a nation um, is, is very different in history uh, throughout the different countries. For instance, in Italy, uh, there is a common language. There are many dialects which are very much alive, spoken, less spoken than before, but uh, spoken. And though the, 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 the state is fragile, there is, but there is a language, there is a common language. And the state, the state building is fragile because maybe um, the, you know, there is not a parallel. You know, for France, there was a parallel between the political effort to build a nation, to build institutions, and so on and so forth, and uh, the language uh, matter issue. Um, because Richelieu and, and its continuer and Louis XIV, there was the 14th and all, had a, a plan, a global plan for um, unifying the, the, the country. Is it the only solution? I, I don't think. I don't think. It's, it's, it's our history. Of course, it's a very uh, comfortable situation because when you compare to Spain, for instance, in Spain, for the moment, the, the language issue is very important because it's, it's exactly the, the contrary, it's the opposite process. The regions who want to, to have more autonomy, they defend their language against the common language, which is the Castellano. So uh, when you have meetings, uh, administrative meetings nowadays in Spain, you will have, for instance, five people from different re provinces and five translators, though all of them, they speak the common language, but they don't want, they don't want. So this is, um, uh, uh, of course, much more com comfortable when you have this uh, possibility like, like uh, we have. It, there are dangers about uh, this topic because uh, there is a, a European uh, convention which is called uh, La Convention Européenne des Langues Régionales, uh, which had been uh, signed but not ratified. And uh, our president has decided to ratify this convention. Uh, we had a discussion with him about that. Um, and he is convinced that we can use it without, uh, without breaking this, uni this unity of the language. It's not sure. It's not sure, because in this convention it is said that uh, when you have a local regional language, for instance, uh, Brittany, for instance, eh, le Breton, uh, you can go to court and uh, you can, uh, you, 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 if, you, if you want, you, you can be, uh, you can have your, your trial in your regional language, which is Something very dangerous, but anyway, for the moment we have this this language. In the case of a, of a, a what you say a young country, uh, a what? It's good to be young. Yeah. yeah I'm not complaining. Actually. It's very good. I can tell you, uh, you'll realize that. Uh, no, but you know, it means that you have to find your own way. I mean, it's uh, maybe, maybe the own way for, for a country like Malaysia, but I speak without any knowledge about the, the, the real situation. But as you explained, I mean, the indirect rules of the British has created, um, I mean, the, the base of a multi, uh, multicultural state. 
So this is your history, so you have to cope with that. Uh, is it realistic to impose a common language? Of course there would be advantage for that, but certainly there would be many resistance and maybe, maybe you can take advantage to have this um, possibility of having more, you want to acknowledge more the, the existence of community. We don't have, because our history is much more, you know, uh, tight, I should say, you know, and this, in some ways, is good, and for some ways, is. I think one close analogy to Malaysia, the closest in Europe would be Switzerland, maybe, where you have a nation where everybody speaks different languages, but they can still come together, support the football team together, and all that. So, no, that's the best example it came to mind. But uh, I want to draw the parallel between the young state and, and Bahasa as a relatively young language, and one of the indicators of it being a very young language is that um, it's a very flexible enough language that it can accommodate different languages into it. So any, if you take out a newspaper and read any article, you'll find Arabic words there. It's quite identifiable because it's a Roman alphabet, right, Bahasa. You can find English, English words there everywhere. Um, and largely this is included because uh, being a young sort of nation, we haven't really solidified our prejudices yet. I mean, prejudices are there, but it hasn't been totally solidified, right? Um, and Bahasa is also gender inclusive. There's no, there's no, there are nouns once in a while, but grammatically, it isn't uh, gendered. So, dia can be a he or she or even them, depending on the context. So a lot of it's tonal. So I guess one lesson from Malaysia is that rather than thinking of language as a, as a property, to sort of like hold on to, maybe we can acknowledge that the aspects of language that are more fluid, that people internalize it and, and it adapts to different contexts and gets a life of its own, right? Because what happens when we connect the national question to the linguistic question? Language becomes a question of who owns it and that just narrows uh, the discussion uh, even more. We have time for one more question. Yes. Ah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very interesting debate. I'm African from Egypt, and I, I lived, I'm a medical doctor, I'm a surgeon. I worked uh, for nine years in Republic of Benin, where I saw a lot of uh, very bad diseases. I, I, uh, my first emergency, I'm surgeon, and my first emergency was a rupture uterus. And I must cope with it. And I, uh, I did uh, orthopedic surgery, I did pediatric surgery, and I saw how the poverty Benin at that time was one of the uh, poorest uh, five countries in the world. So I, I, I saw how uh, Africa was uh, in need of, of help. And, and France is always there behind the, the old French colonies. Huh? And I think, as you mentioned, now, now the situation in many African countries getting better. But now I'm talking about what you mentioned about Iraq. After destroying one country completely, bring the country, one of the richest countries of the world, uh, 50 years uh, uh, back, uh, just because uh, a big lie, something catastrophic in, in, in a world of globalization, of justice, of United Nations, of Security Council, and all this. And now we have another catastrophe in Yemen. Yemen, many countries involved there. And, and Yemen is not a rich country. Now imagine in, 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 in 21st century, we have famine. People die because they cannot find food in Yemen. What's happening in Libya? Libya is, is one of the most richer, richest country in the world. And now they are really in a very difficult situation. So I, I want to ask with your long experience as a physician also, what is the treatment? Because with all the trials, uh, uh, I don't know if it is uh, from the heart or just uh, decoration, still people die, people war everywhere, and uh, poverty and all the diseases, everything there. Thank you very much. Yeah, just a word, just to say that um, I think 
we should differentiate, differentiate the situation in Yemen and uh, the, the two other examples you've given, uh, uh, Libya and, and Iraq, uh, where interventions of um, Western uh, powers, great powers, I mean, France, uh, United States, uh, France and, and, and Great Britain for Libya and United States and alias for Iraq, um, which is a different situation in, in Yemen, which the intervention is more uh, uh, the responsibility of, uh, of uh, a local uh, neighbor, I mean the Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> but if, uh, I won't discuss that, but um, you are very right yeah, yeah, in, in uh, emphasizing the fact that uh, destroying a state is something easy. I mean, it's, it's very easy to destroy a state. Uh, but rebuild a state is almost impossible. I mean, it's a long process. And I think the, the, the great uh, lesson of these last uh, 10, 15 years is that uh, before even for good reasons, even for humanitarian reasons or for extending freedom of the people, before destroying a state, uh, we must really know what we will put in place of that, you know, because uh, our responsibility is very high. Uh, when you create the chaos, uh, nobody can, can substitute uh, the power that you have destroyed, nobody. And the humanitarian action it's just a little uh, thing, a little, you know, effort put on a huge, on a huge uh, necessity that you can, you know, it's not the humanitarian uh, volunteers who can solve this problem. Once a state is destroyed, nobody can uh, replace it. And so I think we have been uh, very confident uh, for a long time. Uh, in the fact that, uh, you know, when there was a dictator, you kill the dictator and then uh, the paradise uh, comes. It's not like that at all. And I think our government are much more responsible now on what they do in such a situation because uh, uh, we have created, I should say, um, really big disasters uh, by uh, decisions which were made for good reasons, maybe. And uh, speaking about Libya, Libya, the, the intervention on Libya had terrible consequences. Uh, first of all, in Sahara and in the south, uh, toward Mali, Chad, and uh, all the neighbors of the region. Then. Uh, in the north, with Tunisia and Egypt, uh, also it spread the chaos uh, and the danger to its neighbors. And now to the north, with the migrants, the migrants who uh, are uh, now uh, uh, explored by the mafias uh, in the Libyan coast and who uh, go to sink in the Mediterranean. So, uh, I mean, but it's, you know, I don't want to finish like that. You know, I would like to finish by something more, uh, not optimistic, but you know, uh, maybe that's why I write novels, because uh, sometimes, and this is maybe a solution, uh, when you are fed up with the world as it is, you create another one, and it's good also. And on that note, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Um, thank you to everybody as well for being a part of the discussion. I'm Ahmad Farah Ahmad. I think there's food as well at the back. <laughs>